Hello and welcome to Social Work in Mental Health. I'm Janine Mariscotti and I'm on the faculty in the Social Work Department at LaSalle University. And today my guests are Jake Bowling and Alicia Coffey from the uh, Mental Health Association of Southeastern Pennsylvania. Welcome Jake and Alicia. Uh, maybe we could start with each of you talking a little bit about your roles at uh, the association. Sure, sure. Um, I'm the director of advocacy and policy at the Mental Health Association. So uh, what we do is uh, implement the public policy initiatives of, of our organization, which include community organizing, policy analysis, uh, visiting with legislators. Mm -hmm. and we also run a number of direct service programs out of the division as well. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Alicia? I'm the advocacy manager mm -hmm. and I get to be, uh, I have a dual role. I manage a team of advocates who are doing direct service work with people on the front lines. Um, one of them is a specialist in benefits and then I have two others who are based in institutions in, Phil in the Philadelphia area mm -hmm. and then I also get to do the legislative and the policy analysis piece that Jake was talking about. Great, right. so you wear a couple of different hats. I sure do. Yeah. Um, would you start by talking a little bit about what you see as the most salient issues uh, in the area of mental health and mental health services particularly in the Philadelphia area? Sure. Um, I think that one important thing for social workers to know is that we work in a, in a system that's transformed, recovery transformed. So we're, we're getting away from the medical model, hmm. uh, the model that says that uh, social workers or practitioners are the experts um, on everything and, and really puts power back into, the, into participants' lives right. to make their own choices. So we take supportive roles to help mm -hmm. people uh, move forward in their recovery. Uh, and and uh, what recovery is, is bigger than just uh, managing symptoms. Okay. It's being a part of your community, contributing to your family, uh, doing the things that make life important and special and purposeful. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the system is moving in a direction that really tries to facilitate opportunities for people to recover. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of undergirded by the belief that people with mental health conditions can and do recover. Okay. Um, so, so we believe that, we see that, and at the Mental Health Association, uh, two, about two thirds of the people who work there self-identify as people in recovery okay. um, or family members. Mm -hmm. So it's living proof that recovery is possible. Right. Uh, could you speak a little bit about the stigma surrounding mental illness. So, I, you know, I, I understand that this movement toward a much more um, empowerment-focused approach um, to people living with mental illness, um, and yet there is still great stigma. You know, most of us will admit that we have a physical illness, mm -hmm. but a lot of us will not admit if we're being treated or dealing with a mental illness. So I wonder if you speak a little bit about that. You know, even the language we use is so interesting. We identify um, a person living with diabetes as a person living with diabetes. Right. Um, we talk about someone living with schizophrenia, schizophrenia as being schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. Like their diagnosis defines them. And we, there's this kind of overarching idea that, that that diagnosis is from a book. That book knows more than the individual knows, mm -hmm. knows more than the providers of services of that individual knows, and that what is said in that book about that person is the infinite truth about that person. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really interesting how we even talk about someone living with a mental health condition. Right. Um, we talk about them sometimes as being um, a victim of a mental health condition, mm -hmm. where in reality, you know, you're someone living with a mental health condition in the same way that you would be managing your physical health conditions. We all should have the chance to be able to manage our behavioral health conditions. Right. And the part of stigma that really gets in the way of that is not only systemic stigma where we don't like to talk about it as, as, as a society and as a larger group, but there's a lot of self-stigma as well. People who aren't um, comfortable talking about what's going on for them because they feel some way about it. Right. That if they are experiencing symptoms of depression, that that must indicate to them that they're weak. Mm -hmm. Heaven forbid that they should talk to a family member who then might think they're weak. Heaven forbid that they should talk to their, their doctor who then might think they're, that they're weak. So there's um, this idea that stigma is also is so systemic that 
that there's this overarching um, societal view accompanied with this very individual perspective of ourselves as someone living with a mental health condition. Right. And what are some of the ways that you're trying to re-educate both people who are living with a mental health condition as well as family members and the larger society? I think the one strategy in the advocacy division uh, that we engage in is community education about first kind of the ways that um, stigma looks. Mm -hmm. and, and stigma is really discrimination, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it results in discrimination. Sure. And there are really uh, real concrete examples of people with mental health conditions interfacing with various systems that discriminate against them, whether it's an insurance company that charges a mm -hmm. higher copay for a mental health and behavioral health services and a comparable uh, physical or medical health right. service, whether it's uh, housing discrimination or a doctor that says, oh, Jake has a depression, so even though he's reporting about a physical illness, I don't know if I could quite believe him mm -hmm. because, you know, Jake, he's depressed, right? right? So, so we kind of educate people about the ways that might look uh -huh. and encourage them to advocate for themselves. We also try to uh, challenge misconceptions that contribute to stigma. Uh -huh. So uh, one example of that is a mental health and violence. Mm -hmm. So if you watch Law and Order, yeah. or if you watch the news, or if you watch any kind of prominent media source, uh, you'll see a very clear link, uh, a portrayal of a very clear link yeah. between mental health and violence. Well, the data does not substantiate that, nor support it. Uh -huh. um, so, so what we spend a lot of time educating the community that People with mental health conditions make a trivial contribution to overall violence in society, mm -hmm. um, despite a very persuasive and pervasive, uh, you know, portrayal of the in the media of people with mental health conditions being violent, right. and also that um, actually people with mental health conditions are much more likely to be victims mm -hmm. of violent crime, and that kind of folds back into stigma and discrimination. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so. Part of our function as advocacy division is to really try to, uh, you know, address some of those myths mm -hmm. and educate the community um, by offering them uh, facts mm -hmm. uh, that, that research supports. Okay. I think another way that we try to reduce stigma and, and share the message of recovery is by helping people learn how to reach out to the people who are in charge of making these decisions. Mm -hmm. We facilitate uh, the communication between uh, people who are examples of recovery and their legislators who are legislating, you know, how much funding um, right. gets put into, into health and human services, which directly affects um, you know, mental health services. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really exciting part of what we do mm -hmm. is uh, being that bridge between a person in recovery and then a person who makes decisions about how those services that encourage recovery get funding. Right, right. You talked about in addition to doing the advocacy work that you also have some direct service programs. Would you talk a little bit about those? Sure, sure. Um, one of our programs that's been really exciting in the past year is that we were selected as one of the uh, navigator entities in Pennsylvania, hmm. uh, tasked with helping educate people about the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. uh, and the health insurance marketplace and uh, providing direct consumer assistance to help people who are uninsured mm -hmm. uh, enroll in, in health plans. Uh, so that's been uh, a really exciting um, kind of adventure to be a part of history yes. you know, and the rollout of this um, sea change in the way we deliver health in America. Uh, another uh, program that we have is called Beating the Blues. And hmm. Beating the Blues is a web-based intervention for people with mild to moderate anxiety and depression. So it's actually an innovation in that people are uh, using this program from, uh, from the comfort of their own homes uh -huh. and learning cognitive behavioral therapy concepts right. and doing activities and practicing and uh, kind of applying those concepts to their lives, uh, mm -hmm. you know, throughout throughout the program, and we provide peer mm -hmm. support to help people move through the program. And, and then, how would someone find out or get if they wanted to 
learn more about that particular program or one of your other programs? Sure. Um, our programs are listed on our website. Okay. Uh, it's www.mhasp.org. Okay. And there's a service listing uh, where they can view all our different programs. Uh, and, and obviously, if they call um, our main number, uh, they would be um, triaged to whatever right. you know they would need. But we have a we have a number of programs across Southeast Pennsylvania, and then mm -hmm. Alicia also has some really great programs that she uh, leads. Okay, so tell us a little bit about some of those programs. Sure. Okay. So I told you a little bit about my direct advocates, right? And there's, there's four of them. Mm -hmm. um, we have someone whose job is to make sure that people who are trying to get uh, health care benefits are able to do so. He helps them interface with the systems of Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, um, anything that would help people get their benefits. He's there to kind of help cut through the red tape. Mm -hmm. And something really valuable that he brings to his position is uh, about 20 years of networking. Oh, um, yeah. He always knows the right person to call. And that's just incredibly valuable to, yes. to the advocacy division. Um, his, uh, his wife actually also works for us, so they make a great team at home and also a great team in the office. Uh -huh. And she's doing really very general direct services. Any roadblock people are experiencing in access to services, they call Fran. Wow. And she's really able to bust down doors. Mm -hmm. And I think one of her key strengths is resources. If Fran doesn't have the answer, she knows who to get it from. Mm -hmm. And she knows what organizations are doing what in the city of Philadelphia. And uh, she's a very, uh, very fantastic team member. And then I have two other advocates who, uh, we have one at Norristown State Hospital mm -hmm. and one at the Einstein Crisis Center. And they're there to make sure that as people are, are hospitalized, that their rights are being respected, right. that they have the opportunity to say yes or no to different treatment modalities, mm -hmm. that they're getting the services that they're legally entitled to, and they're being treated with the dignity that they're entitled to as a fellow human being. Right. So the people I work with, I admire very much. The work they're doing is incredibly important on the front lines. Mm -hmm. And you know, as, as advocates and, and working on you know, higher level policy work, so much of our work is informed by direct practice mm -hmm. and them being able to see what's going on out there in the world, boots on the ground, what are people experiencing. Right. And there's, it's such a needed relationship between the direct advocates and um, you know, policy advocates to really keep that information channel going. So we all know, right. you know where are the roadblocks and how do we bust through them. Right. And it's just a vital relationship to have with uh, policy advocates and, and direct service providers. Yeah, one of the things that I really uh, appreciate about your organization is just that, what you just described, that relationship uh, between advocates and direct practitioners mm -hmm. so that they're always, you, you keep them linked mm -hmm. together um, so that there is that kind of uh, feedback loop between the two that's happening all the time to, to really increase and um, provide better services um, for people with mental health conditions and their families. Uh, we need to take a break for a moment. Uh, when we come back, um, I know only a little bit I learned recently about a program uh, that you uh, are involved in, it's uh, called Peer Specialist. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe when we come back, you could speak a little bit more about that, that program and, and if there are others that you'd like to highlight, uh, I would appreciate that. Uh, this is uh, Social Work in Mental Health and uh, we'll be back in a moment.
Hey fellow TV viewers, are you bored? Are you tired of the same old shows? Having thousands of channels to watch, but there's nothing there? Tired of sitting by yourself on your old mama's striped couch? Sitting in your room by yourself, watching someone who resembles your grandfather? Yeah, I know, I used to be just like you. By now, all hope is lost. You're flipping through channels, wondering what to watch. Boring, 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 boring. Wait, what's this? LaSalle TV. It's new, it's bold, it's great, it's not your ordinary TV. Hello and welcome back. I'm Janine Mariscotti from the Department of Social Work at LaSalle University and this is Social Work in Mental Health. Our guests today are Jake Bowling and Alicia Coffey from the Mental Health Association of Southeastern Pennsylvania. So right before the break we were talking a little bit about the different services that your organization provides and I had mentioned just recently actually one Jake had participated in a panel um, uh, continuing ed workshop that we offered and talked about the peer support specialist program that really intrigued me and I was hoping you talk a little bit a little bit more about that program. Sure yeah so um, there's a credential in Pennsylvania called certified peer specialist mm -hmm. and the certified and in our organization we have a number of certified peer specialists who work for us uh -huh. and kind of the idea behind certified peer specialists is that some of the people who are best equipped to help support people in their recovery or people who've experienced recovery themselves. Mm -hmm. it's, it makes sure. a lot of sense, right? And um, so, so what is being done in Pennsylvania is that people in recovery are being trained as certified peer specialists. Actually, the Mental Health Association is one of the trainers uh, oh. for certified peer specialists in Pennsylvania. And they can work in a variety of settings ranging from uh, inpatient settings mm -hmm. to day programs uh, to uh, uh, CIRCs, uh, Recovery and Education Centers, mm -hmm. but also we really like the model of having teams of mobile certified peer specialists mm -hmm. who go out and engage people in their communities mm -hmm. and, uh, and support people's recovery and, and kind of really walk, walk with folks right. as they traverse uh, various systems. Yeah. And the Mental Health Association is, is unique because many of our uh, programs are powered by peers. Mm -hmm. So we, we really uh, are bought into the philosophy and, and we've seen how amazing it, it is mm -hmm. to watch two peers uh, support one another. Yeah. I, I would imagine that you know when I think about those who might be watching our show in the Philadelphia community, that some people might say, well, what happens then when the person who is the peer specialist uh, has a crisis of their own, or you know, how do you, what do you do in situations like that? And you know, maybe you could speak a little bit to that. I mean, I would imagine you do a lot of work around self-care. Absolutely, right. A lot of so. I think that a, a part of the way that we talk about what we do always involves a good, uh, always involves self-care, mm -hmm. uh, being mindful of your own wellness. Mm -hmm. um, maybe being, being mindful of your own triggers. Yeah. Uh, one tool we use is called the Wellness Recovery Action Plan or the hmm. RAP. Hmm. And what the RAP does is help people think in advance about what it looks like when they're well, what it looks like when things maybe start to go downhill, mm -hmm. what their triggers are, and what their wellness tools are. Okay. And people can use an, a RAP for their job. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and I think anybody, you know, is prone to having a crisis in their li lives. Sure. And the same things that we would encourage any employee uh, to do, which is reach out for additional support, right. um, we would, I think, encourage our, our peers to do that as well. Right. I think our supervisors are also very strong and keen mm -hmm. uh, to the experience of their employees, uh, making sure that employees are kind of keeping their, their boundaries and, and mm -hmm. managing their own wellness because 
as you know, as a social worker and right. anybody in the helping profession, uh, we all have to be mindful of our own wellness. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that your organization uh, could actually be very healthy <laughs> in comparison to some organizations that aren't directly dealing with some of the things you are because you really are very aware mm -hmm. of the need for those kinds of things like maintaining good boundaries and taking care of oneself, recognizing one's triggers. I mean, I think in any organization, wouldn't it be great if every person had a rep yeah. <laughs> that we were working with, Absolutely. regardless of mental health condition uh, or not? You're, these, you're right, these are really universal concepts. Absolutely, right? and, yeah. and I think that anyone, I, first, I think that everyone's in recovery, right? So right. everyone is kind of recovering from, from something. Sure. Everyone has lived experience that informs the reason that we enter this field, right. probably. Right. Um, and everyone can uh, benefit from knowing what keeps them well, what's in their wellness toolbox, right. um, and, um, and what, what their potential triggers are, mm -hmm. and what kind of support they need when things right. become really challenging. So. I think that we endeavor to really infuse that philosophy in, in everything that yeah. we do. I, I really liked that question because it's very reflective of the philosophy of recovery. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not like linear, you know, people, yes. you know, recovery looks different for so many people. So someone who's in recovery and is working as a certified peer specialist may experience crisis sure. because, you know, there are setbacks in recovery just like there's setbacks in any other endeavors of your life. Exactly. So, you know, that's kind of built in socially in, into the work that we do, recognizing that a peer specialist may have a setback mm -hmm. and, and may need more support. And it's wonderful that our organization really is more mindful about that yes. for employees in general because we have these very um, informal peer support networks that mm -hmm. we really rely on mm -hmm. and is really encouraged. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, really, we're really capable of, of supporting each other. Uh, we may be doing very different things, but it's interesting to hear even how we talk to each other, the way we respect each other, and hey, let me check in with you. How are you doing? Yes. And, and if the answer to that question is uh, about work, sometimes we then follow up with, and how's your life? You know, it's, it's that other layer of you're not only someone who sits behind a desk and, and produces something, right. but you're a human being that carries that with you. Yeah. How can we support that in an informal peer support way? Yeah, it's very humane. It really is. That's, That's what it sounds absolutely. like. It sounds very humane. Yeah. Imagine that, huh? Yeah. Um, we're all social workers, the three of us here, and I'm hoping you will talk a little bit about the kinds of things that social workers, uh, the kinds of work that social workers can do in this field, because I know you do a particular type of work, but in the area of mental health services, there's a lot of possibilities for social workers. Mm -hmm. And um, tell us a little bit more about what some of you know, the graduates of our program might do uh, when, they, when they get out of school. I mean, that's huge. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think one of the, when I talk about social work as a field, I always say the best thing about it is that whatever your pers personal passion is, bringing that to the people mm -hmm. in a mindful way can become social work. Um, there are some groups that are doing really important work that because they're doing it from a social work lens, it's social work. Mm -hmm. Back, there's an organization called Back on My Feet, which is about running for people who have lived experience of being homeless. Uh -huh. And so, it's just really exciting to see how this person has has uh, turned her love of running into a into a social service as mm -hmm. a as a as a social worker. Um, so I think that whatever your personal passion is, if you bring that to the people in a way that is transformational, mm -hmm. you're doing social work. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's yeah. it's amazing. Uh, social work has a the social work degree has a high level of versatility. Mm -hmm. So um, whether you want to you know, get your LCSW and become a clinician and help support people in their recovery in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you want to go into public policy work right. uh, and or work for an elected official or do policy analysis or become a community organizer. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you want to do case work to help people um, get the resources they need that would facilitate recovery. Mm -hmm. I think that there's so much space for that degree. And the, and the social work philosophy just lends itself so well to mental health services mm -hmm. because social work isn't, we can't kind of extricate the, um, the big picture from social work. Right. Even direct practice 
uh, folks in social work understand right. the big picture's contribution mm -hmm. to that individual or family's experience. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the social work po policy practitioner understands that what's happening on the ground is what should inform their policy agenda. So mm -hmm. it goes back to that feedback loop. Right, exactly. And I think that there's, so there's just a range of opportunities mm -hmm. and the social work philosophy that kind of uh, holds intention and kind of the, the, the big picture with the individual and family's experience is really suited for, uh, for a number of opportunities. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's a great point. Uh, I wonder if there's one thing that you would want the community, the Philadelphia community to know. So the citizens of Philadelphia, if there's one point that you could make in the few minutes that we have left around this issue, what might it be? With appropriate supports and access to those appropriate supports, recovery is possible. Recovery looks different for every person and they should have the right to define what recovery looks like for themselves mm -hmm. and be well supported to reach those goals. Okay. Honey. Yeah. I, I, can I ditto that? That was great. That was great. Uh, yeah. yes. <laughs> I would absolutely echo um, what yeah. Alicia shared about recovery and also say the, the one in four people mm -hmm. this year uh, will experience a diagnosable mental health condition. Mm -hmm. So mental health is not a fringe issue yes. and as such legislators and policymakers should be responsive yeah. to the needs of mental people with mental health conditions and their families mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania and elsewhere. So we should never feel like um, feel like we're a small group, we're, we're a mighty and powerful group and we should continue um, advocating for right. better services and less stigma. Excellent. So we only have a few seconds, but I um, wanted to ask about an event. I think you have an event coming up soon yeah. that uh, please let our community know about that. Okay. Uh, so we have the Day of Mental Health mm -hmm. and, and Dignity on May 4th. We're having an event at Temple University, okay. uh, and we're, we're showing a movie called Of Two Minds, and it's a documentary mm. about uh, a person's, a few people's experience with bipolar disorder. Great. Um, so for more information, you can go to our website. Give us that again. www.mhasp.org. Great. Thank you both very much uh, to Jake and to Alicia. Um, this is uh, Social Work in Mental Health. Um, I'm Janine Mariscotti from the Social Work Department at LaSalle. Our department is growing. Uh, we have uh, programs during the day, evening, and in an accelerated format. So please come and check us out and come grow with us. Thank you very much.